Okay. Um, this is uh, Richard Sullivan, and we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And the first uh, item of business is the roll call. Dr. Sullivan? Here. Ms. Schaffeld? Here. Dr. Bradbury? Here. Dr. Lazarchap? He is absent. Ms. Laredo? Here. Dr. Payton? Here. Ms. Salazar Sperber? Here. Dr. Sequoia? She is absent. Ms. Estri? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I actually uh, don't have any remarks uh, other than I'm glad to have the people that are here and those others that are on the website. Uh, we don't have a lot of material, but uh, we do have a couple of very important issues that we need to really work on today or this afternoon. So do any other members of the committee have any comments? Okay. So the um, first item of business is the uh, April 19th committee meeting minutes. Are there any uh, corrections or? Public. We need to do public comment first for three. For, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back to uh, public comments on items not on the agenda. Okay, seeing none in the room, uh, I'll ask the uh, moderator to open to open uh, it up for uh, any comments uh, from uh, the public uh, online. Uh, this is the moderator, and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public on WebEx, if you would like to make a comment, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. Um, and for um, any participants who are audio only, um, you can uh, use the raise hand option um, by pressing star three on your device. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Uh, please, thank you. So now we'll move on to item four, which is the um, approval of the April 19th uh, committee min uh, meeting minutes. Any comments or corrections? I have a couple just to <clears throat> um, note. There's various parts throughout the meeting minutes where it says board and it should be the MDC. So if the board could approve, include in the motion um, to amend all um, applicable sections where it says board, where it says sh should be MDC to make that change. And then also on page nine, where it says uh, not with the, notwithstanding subsection Q, it should actually be R because that was updated. Yeah, Tara. My light's not going on. Let me try this one. Okay, um, to clarify on page nine, it's not changing notwithstanding Q, it's changing the question. Halfway in, uh, in the middle of the page, Dr. Bradbury inquired what were the final revisions to CCR Title 16, Section 2030.3, subsection Q. We're changing that reference from Q to R. Yeah. Um, and also to clarify, um, Ms. Sieferman's initial correction on changing board to MDC. I just wanted to point out an example of that is on page two, item three, public comment. It says the board received the following public comment. Uh, we, we need to change board to committee. The committee received the following public comment. So any instance of something where the board is receiving or um, public comment or uh, asking for public comment, that would change to committee. And asking for, asking for a motion as well. 
it's also on page nine, um, Dr. Sullivan requested public comment before the board acted on the motion. We want it to change to the committee. So we'll make all those changes. Okay, any other corrections or comments? We have to open up the public, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, moderator, uh, I'm sorry, let's open up to the public here first. Any comments from the room? And for the record, too, Dr. Sequoia just joined as well. Welcome, Dr. Sequoia. Okay. Um, any comments from uh, uh, moderator? Could you please open the uh, uh, online and uh, uh, the WebEx to see if there's any comments from the public and from, uh, I guess, from our board member, our members, our MDC members that are uh, on WebEx also. Um, this is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment, please click that Q&A icon, look at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel or raise hand feature. Um, and in the meantime, while we're waiting on that, uh, Dr. Sequoia, could I get a quick mic check from you just to confirm that your microphone is working? Uh, looks like you unmuted uh, temporarily and then remuted. You may want to click the button one more time. Oh, uh, unfortunately, it keeps muting you. Um, I'm going to click request to unmute. We haven't had a motion yet. Oh, we're taking time. We need to take a motion and then do public comment again. If we haven't, there's no motion to approve on that amendment yet. Okay. We'll get down. We'll get it. <laughs> We're ready. Very. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, Dr. Sequoia, I'm unable to hear you on the microphone. Uh. Um, one moment, um, I'm going to go, I don't see any uh, requests for public comments, so I'm going to go ahead and close that uh, Q&A feature. In the meantime, I'm going to get um, some audio instructions up on the slide um, for Dr. Sequoia um, to hopefully uh, help with the microphone. So one moment. Should I keep going? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we need a motion and then we have to go back to public comment. So I need a motion. Uh, to, ad uh, to adopt the minutes as amended. I move to adopt the minutes as amended. I can second that. Okay. Any further discussion from the board, from the committee? <laughs> okay. If none, then we have to open it up again for public comment. Um, from members in the room. Seeing none, we'll now open it for, uh, please moderator, could you open it for the public comments on, from WebEx? All right, uh, this is a moderator. And once again, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And Dr. Sequoia, I have put up instructions up on the screen on how to switch your audio from um, your computer to your phone and hopefully that helps. Um, so uh, I'll pause a moment to allow the public to uh, indicate if they would like to make a comment and also see if um, Dr. Sequoia is able to get uh, her audio connected. Thank you. 
Um, and this is the moderator, Dr. Sequoia. I see your microphone is unmuted, but I'm not hearing any audio. Um, if uh, what you can try do, doing is um, logging off the WebEx and logging back in, see if that helps, or um, following the instructions to connect to your phone's audio. Um, in the meantime, I don't see any requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. So we have a motion, and I'll call for the um, for the vote. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Felt? Yes. Dr. Bradbury? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Dr. Payton? Abstain? Uh, Ms. Salazar? Sperber? Yes. Dr. Sequoia? I know that we're having mic issues, so I'm going to not record her vote right now. Uh, Ms. Ustry? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Um, item number five um, on our agenda is update discussion and potential recommendations to the board regarding pending rulemaking proposals. Um, and that is um, um, Schufelt and Ms. Laredo. Perfect. So I can start us off here. We have been talking about um, the RVT student education package um, for a little while now. And since our last meeting, it's in the memo, but we have been uh, looking back at the RVT rulemaking package that was originally approved by the board or talked about and approved by the board uh, between 2016 and 2020. And um, having re looked at the initial discussions on this and um, followed up on some of the things. We have um, taken a look at the package as it was approved in 2020 and um, have decided we would like to move forward with the education requirements or of removing the um, requirements for the RVTs to have had um, their experience over the last uh, five years and then the experience for the RVT um, pathway for over the past 24 months. So that part of it we were comfortable with leaving and it is documented in the, um, in the memo that we sent out to you guys. We also have been continuing to look at the equivalency of AVMA um, equivalence schools and whether or not the board should also have to approve the RVT schools in California. So. As part of that part of it, we have, um, or Jessica has reached out to the AAVSB who've talked to the other, or we've gotten responses from 14 different states and what they do for RVT um, equivalency and all of those kind of things. So um, all of the schools do automatically approve AVMA accredited programs. And there is only a couple schools that do approve an alternate route type program. Um, and then we've also, after our last meeting in January, or sorry, after the meeting in January, been talking about the possibility of, um, sorry, I've lost my spot. Sorry, Leah, just to clarify, when you said sorry. schools, it's the, the board, all of the boards um, yes, so far. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. You're totally fine. My internet died on me, so now I have to find this again. So, yes, we have um, the, that the boards do not approve the schools within their states, that they don't have a part of doing that. So, um, sorry, I've jumped all over the place here. Uh, what we have come up with would be proposed um, language for now for the original education package that the board has already approved in 2020. Uh, the parts of it that we would like to look at moving forward after discussion at this meeting would be to um, the BPC section 4841.1, the animal health care tasks for students. We would like to continue that through the rulemaking process. Um, having to do with the supervision of veterinary technician students that 
Um, they would be able to perform the duties of an RVT from 2036 uh, while under the direct supervision of a veterinarian and an, or an RVT. So that would be for students in their second year of their education program as RVTs and then um, continue to look at the rest of that rulemaking package. The only thing we would like to um, strike for now would be the part talking about education having to be within the last um, two years for the or 24 months it was originally written, but we do think that's burdensome for applicants to have to uh, do all of their skills within a 24 month period before uh, applying to take their exam. So that is the part of the regulations we've looked at. Um, and we've also been continuing to look at equivalency of AVMA schools versus the um, all of the guidelines that we have in California for RVT school approval and um, looking at the possibility of outside agencies being able to help us with regulating those schools. Um, so I think it's all written well in the, the memo. Um, if Jennifer has anything to add for clarity's sake. Thank you, Leah. I just wanted to add that it was very eye-opening to see what other state boards are doing and that they do also rely on um, accrediting bodies outside of the board. And there is no reason for us to be doing this duplicate work. So I agree with everything that Leah said. I agree with the way the memo is. And um, just in the interest of time and efficiency, it would not be prudent to hold the entire rulemaking package just while we review this one issue, but we do need more time to review this. So we are asking that the, the committee um, agree with our recommendation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bradbury. Hi everyone. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person today, um, but I'm so glad that we had this opportunity to participate in this manner. Um, my question just relates to, I think it was, was it Dan Laramie from last meeting um, and previous meetings who's asked about the, um, the 2000 hour uh, requirement before entering a program uh, as part of this rulemaking package, I believe, and then uh, the implementation being in, in, you know, having to roll it out by 2024 was, is that somehow um, addressed here. I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't see it in this um, this memo. So I just wondered where we were on those those questions that he had. Yeah, so Dr. Bader, just to clarify, all those concerns were um, regarding the whole thing with uh, approving RTV, our RVT education programs. And so since the committee is still looking at all of that um, what, and really taking a step back and looking at high level, is this something that the board should actually be doing? Um, and then if so, are we, is this the best um, way to proceed? So with that, his concerns about the implementation dates and the hours, uh, none of those are, are changing. So he wouldn't have to worry about the tight time frame for the turnaround because all of it is gonna stay status quo right now while the committee moves forward to re, really reassess the entire um, package that deals with the RVT education program. So all of that is, is um, being removed from this package. So we can continue with the uh, adding the uh, 2036.1 for the animal health care task for RVT students. Um, that was uh, just for clarity purposes that was put in, I think back in 2015 or 2016 to implement a statute that happened from 2011 that the board shall require to uh, promulgate regulations to determine the level of supervision for the RVT students. And so we felt that this really needed to move forward because we, we had been um, required to do this regulation for quite some time. And then also the uh, expiring the uh, education and experience and the 24 month limitation, we felt that that was enough to, to move forward. But because the whole issue with the RVT education was so big, we, they wanted more time to do that, but not hold these items up. Fantastic, thank you. So in, in essence, those are the only two issues that we would like to discuss today. 
as far as moving them forward to the board for their next meeting. Do board do MDC members have any and, comments? Sorry, and to clarify too, the board has already approved all of this language. What we're asking is that the board um, separate the language. Okay. So pull out parts of it from the package, continue that package forward. Okay. Any further discussion from the committee? Okay, uh, then I'll open it up for, oh, do we need a motion first? Yeah, you can take a motion and then. Okay, so um, I'll uh, entertain a motion to move those two items uh, for, uh, well, to separate those two items from the package uh, and move them, uh, have them continue to move forward and remove the other items from the package and recommend that to the board. So moved. Sorry, can we read the actual motion from the... Okay. Yeah. That is on... Do you want me to read it? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, so for clarity purposes, the motion would be to recommend the board retain the addition of new CCR Title 16, Section 2036.1 regarding animal health care tasks for RVT students, remove all the all of the Article 6 proposed amendments except for the amendments to CCR Title 16, Section 2068.5 that strikes the language that had expired the educational and clinical experience and prohibited the education experience from being completed in no less than 24 months and move forward with the RVT education rulemaking package comprised of only those two regulatory sections. We had a, uh, a motion. Did we, did we get a second? Who moved the motion? Was Jennifer? That was was that you? Yes, it was me. Okay. I'll, I'll second it, Dr. Bradbury. Okay. Now we'll open it up for discussion for members of the public here in the room. Grant Miller, CVMA. Hi. Um, I uh, understand that the motion today is to separate the packages. We have no concern with that. But I, I do want to point out a number of um, issues with the language that have kind of emerged over time because this regulatory package has kind of sat for a while. And I think that these might be non-substantive changes that might be within your capability of just fixing um, which would not deter this from moving forward. So if you will, I'd like to just take a moment to, to get clarification on these. So on page um, number 10 in section J, there's a reference to the California veterinary technician exam. Did you see that? Well, just just so you know too, yeah, I, I did see that and I think those are nonsense, but Right now, the, all of that is going to come them. out. It's going to come out Got and it. not even be proposed. So, if you have, okay. I would say, if you have um, comments for on attachment two for okay. that language, that's the only thing we want to move forward because everything else we need to reassess. Got it. Okay. And then I have one other question. So that's all good. Um, there are two section 2068.5s here. Does anyone know which one is the right one? One of them is on page 16. Or no, one of them is on page 13, and then the next one is on page 16. Um, and that'll be something for a future date because I because it's being moved. But if somebody can figure that out, that would be good. So on page 16, that's the start of the second attachment. And so those are that's what we're moving forward, the 2068.5, attachment one, that whole thing is being, um, that's not the one we're moving forward with. We're just moving for that attachment one, Got attachment it. two. Okay. So you'll see it twice. Okay, so the attachment two is the one we should be yes. analyzing. Okay, thank you. These have been so long, I've forgotten. Thank you guys. So do I need to ask for a comment from the board members on WebEx? No, they should have already done it for it. 
Okay, commentator, uh, co moderator, could you please uh, open up the queue for comments uh, uh, from the people on WebEx? Uh, this is the moderator, and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public on WebEx, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use that raise hand function. All right, and it does look like we have a request from one individual. Give me one moment while I get my timer up. Um, you'll be given three minutes to speak and a 15 second warning. Uh, Nancy uh, Al uh, Arlick, um, I'm going to request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the uh, prompt appears on your device. Uh, let me know. Uh, there's a lot of interference with the uh, video, uh, with the audio, so we're having some difficulty hearing you. Uh, Nancy, I just muted you. It sounds like there's some um, audio interference happening. Um, you may want to make sure that you are um, only have one connection to the WebEx um, and that maybe you're using um, headphones. Um, I'm going to request to unmute again and hopefully we don't have that issue. <laughs> so uh, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears. Is that it? Nope. Uh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, it looks like I have you um, logged in twice. If you could close out of one of the WebEx um, that you're logged into, that might solve the issue. Okay, um, Nancy, I'm gonna try one more time. Um, and if um, there's still audio issues, if you need me to, um, I can put up the audio um, instruction slide or you can type your comment and I'll read it for you. Um, so let me try to request to unmute one more time. Uh, it sounds like there still is that feedback. Um, it looks like I, Still, there's still two uh, two logins for you. Uh, maybe you want, what you want to try to do is either log out of the WebEx completely and then rejoin, um, see if that helps, um, or I can um, read off a comment that you type. It looks like I only have one sign in for you now, so I'm going to try to click the request to unmute and see if that works. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and it's that seemed to fix the problem. clear. <laughs> yes. Okay, but uh, since I was having trouble hearing what you were saying, I, I was confused about what the second item is that you're moving forward with. I understand you're moving forward with 2036.1. What is the second item? And um, if our webcaster can unmute um, the microphone again, I temporarily had to mute it because I thought maybe it was um, having our audio issues. Um,
Um, and this is the moderator. Our um, microphone for the uh, DCA uh, headquarters one is still muted. If that can be unmuted so we can hear, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so for clarification, uh, we also, Nancy, are including the, uh, the amendments that happened in July, uh, on, in July of 2020 regarding um, striking the, uh, ex the expiration of the experience and of the education. That is gonna go continue to go through. And then also the limitation on the 24 months that is also being struck and gonna continue to go through. But that, those are the only amendments from 2068.5 going through in this package. Okay, so that's the alternate route. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay, any other comments from WebEx? Uh, this is the moderator. Piers, there are no further requests for comments. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Oh, please, thank you. Okay, um, and it looks like um, we have uh, Dr. Sequoia on. I just wanna confirm that her microphone is working. So Dr. Sequoia, if you could um, do a quick mic check. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear yes. you, thank you. <laughs> Good. All right. So we have a motion, a second, and discussion. So I think we're ready for, oh, Tara. <laughs> Um, clarification, um, Dr. Miller brought up that there were two different versions of 2068.5 um, in this package. Uh, and I did wanna clarify that he's correct. On page 13, um, that version of 2068.5 does contain some minor um, non-substantive technical revisions that um, we'll go ahead and make in the presentation to the board. Uh, an example of uh, a minor non-substantive change uh, that we'll be making. As you can see on page 13, section 2068.5, subsection A, third line would add, um, and this is what the board previously approved, who, uh, for, with respect to a qualified instructor, we would add who satisfies the qualification requirements of subsection F1 and then strike as defined by section 2068.5E. On page 16, which is attachment two, which is what the MDC is recommending be moved to the board. Um, actually, it's page 17, this is section 2068.5 and subsection A, third line, you see qualified instructor, but it still retains the existing language as defined by section 2068.5E. Um, that non-substantive change will be corrected at the board level to reflect the prior corrections to that language that the board made. So that would read qualified instructor comma who satisfies the qualification requirement of subsection E so that it mirrors what the board previously approved in July of 2020 that you can see on attachment one. So there's just a, a couple of those very minor uh, corrections that we'll go ahead and make when uh, the proposal reaches the board. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sukaya, do you have a comment? No, it's just my screen is uh, putting up my hand when I don't have my hand up, sorry. Okay, all right. So I believe we're ready for a roll call or for a vote call right now. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Felt? Yes. Dr. Bradbury? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Dr. Payton? Yes. Ms. Berber? Yes. Dr. Sequoia? Yes. Ms. Ostry? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And now we are going to um, item six on the agenda. And this is an update and potential recommendations to the board. 
on legislative proposals to amend the business code related to uh, the veterinary drug compounding. Uh, we discussed this at our last meeting. Uh, we needed uh, statute and regs to be able to continue doing basic compounding in a clinical practice. Um, as we started writing, uh, as we started the process in writing and getting statutes, statute passed in 2015-16, uh, we, we got that done and then we started writing the regs for that. And those regs were passed last April. However, uh, during that time, um, we then ran into some changes with the U.S. Pharmacopeia's changes to guidelines 795 and 797. Um, our state legislature also adopted law that whatever U.S. Pharmacopeia says in guidelines will be law in California. And then we got the pandemic. So with all of this, we're looking at um, we're looking at having to make changes in um, what we have been doing forever for the last 50 years. And if we want to continue to do in-clinic compounding, we're going to have to make some changes and develop uh, uh, some a paper trail on, on being able to continue to do that. Before I turn it over to Marie, I want to say have a special thanks to Marie and uh, Jessica, Tara, and Karen, who is our uh, OAL specialist from uh, DCA, uh, for working on this and getting us uh, to uh, get work through these uh, bugs that we, we found. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marie to start um, the discussion. Thank you. So previously we had discussed uh, some gaps that were discovered in the paper trail necessary to document office stock preparations. Uh, in the April meeting, additional concerns were raised uh, regarding the efficiency of the process with the current workforce shortages, especially the shortages of RVTs. There were also concerns that were brought up about compounded IV fluid preparations as these preparations change frequently depending on patient needs and Requiring duplicate recording of these would, would be very taxing on anybody having to do that. Uh, we identified ways to resolve these issues by proposing amendments to B BPC 4826.5 and CCR Title 16, Sections 2036.5, 2090, 2091, 2092, and 2094. I don't know if you have anything additional to add, Dr. Sullivan, before we talk about those recommendations. No, I think we should just go ahead and do each section at a time and uh, discuss them. And, and what I really want everyone to, to look at are two things. One, are we still missing some gaps? And two, are there any ways that we can make it more efficient? So let's go ahead and start. Do you want to go ahead and do uh, the regulation, the uh, statute change? Yeah. Page six. I'm sorry, it's Dr. Bradbury here, um, and I should have probably just raised my hand. But is there? I, I'm. I don't see any written um, notes on this to follow. Were, were those provided somewhere that I missed? Uh, yes, those are provided in the MDC uh, packet. It is agenda item six, and there's a background and some background material. And then on page six, it starts with our recommendation on um, changes to the statute. Okay, on uh, my my um, email, I don't. That's the only one that doesn't have a link. Would uh, Jessica, can you send me that so I can open it? Yeah, so Dr. Bebber, if you look on our website under the meeting pages, they're right there. If they're in, they're posted. I can also I'll work. And I got you. it as a separate email from Tim as well last week. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, I was a uh, away. Um, I'll just go to the website. I'll figure it out. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to send you a link right now too. Okay, so 
the recommended addition to BPC 4826.5 is to add a veterinary assistant controlled substance permit holder um, under the supervision of a licensed veterinarian. Um, and that's added in two spots on that, um, which would hopefully alleviate the access to care issue that was inadvertently caused by restricting compounding to DVMs and RVTs. And I think it would also give more incentive to uh, get more permit holders registered for the board too. Uh, any comments from the committee? So do we wanna do a motion for each one of these individually? Okay, so. And the motion, there's two oh, motions yes. listed in the materials. So for this one would be the wedge proposal, the first motion. Okay. Five. All right, what are we? Okay, so we would um, asking, we're asking for a motion uh, for the, um, Legislative change, action, uh, action requested number one. Could I have somebody propose that, make that motion please? So move, Sequoia. And a second. For the record, Dr. Sequoia, would you mind if I read the motion out loud? I would appreciate that, thank you. Okay, so the motion is to recommend to the board the legislative proposal to amend business and professions code section 4826.5 to authorize a veterinary assistant controlled substance permit holder to perform drug compounding. And do Correct. we have a second? Okay. okay, Dr. Payton seconded. Okay, Dr. Payton seconds. Okay, and uh, Comments from the public in the room? Moderator, could you please open uh, the WebEx for any comments from the public? This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, uh, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use that raise hand function. And it does look like we have a request for comment um, from Ms. Eierlich. Um, uh, you will get three minutes to speak and a 15 second warning. I will request to unmute your microphone now. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I'm I'm really shocked by this uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, a VACSP holder. Personally, I don't even think we should have VACSP holders because they have no qualifications other than having uh, passed a criminal background check. I don't see how that qualifies them to be administering controlled substances. Uh, which are the most dangerous drugs we use in a veterinary hospital, never mind compounding drugs. Uh, these people have no specific training. Uh, they're, they're no different than someone who walked in off the street. And um, uh, if you want to uh, make things more accessible, then you should allow RVTs to do more things. Uh, RVTs are the ones that have qualifications to, to do things. Uh, people off the street are people off the street. Uh, I. I would be shocked as a client if I knew that you know, that veterinarians were using people off the street to administer controlled drugs and and now be able to compound drugs. Uh, I think it's outrageous. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Um, the ultimate responsibility of the compounding procedure lies with the with the veterinarian, uh, and there are requirements of this for the veterinarian to. Uh, teach the uh, both the RVT and the permit holder to do the compounding at a level that the veterinarian feels that they're competent. But the ultimate responsibility still falls back onto the veterinarian. Um, and I would disagree with you that these are people off the street. They are, 
Uh, they are people, they are veterinary assistants who are working within the practice that are uh, helping us greatly during these times. And um, uh, we felt that uh, it is a workforce issue that we can uh, fulfill at the request of an RVT that we can fulfill uh, by using a licensed person, a permit holder, to, uh, to do these tasks. Um, as you know, Nancy, what we're talking about is very, very basic compounding. We're talking about removing one milliliter of, of one uh, sterile multi-use vial and putting in it into another. Uh, we're talking about mixing two or three products in a very basic manner. So um, because of the feedback that we got at our last meeting about the workforce issue, uh, which is real and, and, um, and, and important, uh, this is the avenue that we decided fulfills that uh, request immediately and safely with consumer protection. So just to, to clarify to all members of the public, public comment is for uh, questions and comments, um, but not for a dialogue between the, the committee and the public commenters. So what I recommend is if you do have concerns, then you can share those concerns and then the committee as a whole can talk about it when they bring it back. Okay. But it's not for a dialogue between public comment. Moderator, is there anyone else who has public comment on this motion? And Dr. Bradbury, uh, is, I saw that you had your hand up as well. No, it, my my hand. Yes, you you're correct. Uh, my hand was up to to have the dialogue that you're discuss you you mentioned. Um, and this is a moderator. Uh, I don't see any further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Okay. Did she close it? Did she say that was it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you've gone ahead and closed the commentary, correct? Moderator? Uh, yes, that's correct. It's closed. All right. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll open up for the discussion to the board. Any other comments related to this? Does she have her hand up? Yeah. Dr. Bradbury? I just thought I would. Uh... Finalize that. I I really don't have anything more to say. Uh, you said it very well, uh, Dr. Sullivan. That was really just all I wanted to make sure was said. So thank you that that these people are under supervision of a veterinarian. Um, these things are not just done by random people. It's people who have been trained in the veterinary practice, and and it's our licenses that you know we're we're asked. We, we want well trained people doing these things. So, um, but you, you said it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, just a point of clarification. Um, the, the permit holder, I assume that you have to go through some educational process and under and to get your permit. It's not just. It, is what, how do you receive a permit? You have to have a criminal background check for fingerprints and pay a fee. Okay, so but you um, also, sorry, you also have to in order for them to use it, you have to have a an agreement, a supervisor agreement between the veterinarian and the and the permit holder. Okay, that's really what I was getting to. Yeah. Not to mention the fact I'd like to just point out that um, any veterinary premise that engages in compound drug preparations shall establish a quality assurance program, which I just want to you know, clarify that these are not people off the street, that the veterinarians are not just letting um, people, you know, compound drugs without their supervision. The veterinarian, as pointed out earlier, is um, under a lot of obligations to make sure that things are done correctly. Thank you. So there's a motion second. Any more comments from the board? Oh. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Ms. Schaffeld? Yes. Dr. Bradbury? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Dr. Payton? Yes. Ms. Berber? Yes. Dr. Sequoia? 
Yes. Ms. Ostry? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, do I have? Okay, the um, next uh, item, the next group of items are the regulatory proposals. So the first proposal is for 2036.5, um, and that is adding subsection C and D. C being notwithstanding subsection A, permit holders in an animal hospital setting may perform drug compounding from bulk substances under the direct supervision of a licensed veterinarian. And D is notwithstanding subsection A, permit holders in an animal hospital setting may perform drug compounding from non-bulk substances under the direct or indirect supervision of a licensed veterinarian or the direct supervision of an RBT. Do we want to go through each one separately? We probably should have a discussion on each one and then vote on them as a whole. Any discussion uh, from, the uh, from the room? Well, uh, any discussion from the committee first on uh, these uh, two changes or additions? Any comment from the public from the room? And moderator, would you please open the uh, WebEx to find out if there's any comment from the public uh, on the addition of C and D? This is the moderator, not the direction of the board, uh, committee. I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use that raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, um, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Uh, please, thank you. Okay. And then we'll go on to the definitions. We'll do, go through the, all of the definitions and then discuss them. Okay, so in 2090 definitions, in, under A, registered veterinary technician was taken out and RVT or permit holder was added. The same change is being proposed under B, where registered veterinary technician was, and that will now say RVT or permit holder. Under E, there's the addition of immediate use, means administration of a sterile compounded drug preparation on an animal patient within four hours from the time the drug preparation was compounded. F, master formula form, is a list of all drug preparations compounded at the veterinary premises on a regular basis and contains the information specified in subsection B of section 2092. G, there is the addition uh, under office stock that it may be used within the practice or dispensed only to a client. The addition of H, unique formula code, is the designation given to a formula that is listed on the master formula form created pursuant to subsection B of section 2092. And I, unique compounded drug preparation number is a unique number given to each compounded drug preparation prepared for an animal patient or for office stock. Okay. Um, the only thing I would add to the definitions is that uh, when we put together the educational material and actually have a master formula form and actually have a spreadsheet to show you how that formula gets prepared when and when the expiration date and where it goes, then all of this will make sense, hopefully. So um, I'll open it up to the committee to have any comments, either here or uh, those that are online. Now at the last meeting, we went through all of the definitions uh, the ones that are underlined are uh, the changes and the additions that are underlined are the new are the new items. Okay, uh, hearing no comments, are there any comments from the public in the room? Okay. 
Seeing none, then uh, I would like the moderator to open up the WebEx to see if there's any public comments on the definitions. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or click that raise hand function. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. The next changes are, oh, we're going to do it at the end. Next changes will be section 2091. And the only changes to 2091 would be under both B and C, adding or supervise the performance by an RVT or permit holder. Any comments from the committee? Any comments from the public in the room? Okay, moderator, could you please open the uh, WebEx to see if there's any public comments to um, the changes in section 2091? Sure, um, and this is the moderator. Um, I'm going to keep the Q&A feature open for the rest of this section um, just to make things easier and so I don't have to keep repeating myself for <laughs> the instructions. Right. But um, once again, um, the Q&A feature is open for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, you can click that Q&A feature or use the raise hand function. And I'll pause a moment to see if there's any comments on this one. All right, um, it doesn't look like there are, so if you want to um, move to the next one, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, next section is 2092, policies and procedures. Do you want to go over that? The changes to 2092 are a little more in depth. Uh, yes. Um, so the first section, the first item is under 2092 is two. We're just changing uh, to RVT and permit holder. Okay, and then on, on B, um, this is the, we're, we're uh, we had two choices here. One is to require everyone to use the same uh, list of, of, um, uh, of compounding formulas. And the other is to make our list an example so that licensees can do it any way they want. And we're just, we're, uh, what's the term? We're not requiring this to be um, we're not incorporating it by reference. Right. We're not incorporating it by reference. So it's an example. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility. Um, so what we did is that we, we determined one of the biggest gaps we had at our last meeting is that we did not have each formula uh, uniquely identified. So we're calling, uh, we're calling that the uh, unique formula code. So that as it goes through the, the uh, pathway, the spreadsheet, you, you know, we know what we're talking about. It's one formula, it's one menu. So that gets a unique um, formula code. And in that, you're going to have the name, strength, and quantity of each ingredient, the equipment used, the name, strength, and quantity of each inactive ingredient, and um, the specific steps in compounding the preparation. Uh, I think that's it. So, and that uh, we already had um, for our last meeting, that example is, is already uh, made and we'll be going to the board tomorrow with a few minor changes. Um, so, so what we're doing is this is making a, a formula. You know, you may have three or four uh, compounded preparations that you're going to do regularly. You may have 12 or 15, but once they're in there, they stay with that unique number. Um, and then, and that, and that we've titled in our example as a master formula form, and, and those will be listed there. Um, in 
uh, should we just go through the whole thing and then come back? So then in item E, we are exempting inter, inter, uh, intravenous fluid preparations um, from these regulations. And the main purpose of that is that uh, if we're giving IV fluids and we're adding uh, components to those fluids, that might change from hour to hour during the day. And, and all of these uh, administration of fluids are documented already in the medical records. So we, thought, we thought, thought that this was a duplication and totally unnecessary. So we're exempting all intravenous fluid preparations that are being compounded. Um, if you're not adding anything to the fluids, if you're using lactated ringers, we're, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with those fluids where we're adding uh, additional um, medications, electrolytes, or drugs. The wording is a little complex because uh, we needed to make sure that we are capturing what we needed to in legal terms. So, but in essence, that's what we're doing. Tara. Just to clarify, the exemption that Dr. Sullivan is talking about is only from having to maintain a master formula form for these types of preparations because these treatments are unique to each animal patient and likely would not be the same from animal to animal. So you would not have to maintain the master formula form for intravenous fluid preparations and sterile drug preparations for immediate use uh, as long as, you know, they, they qualify under subsection E. They would, however, um, have to comply with the requirements under subsection F, uh, which is a document created and maintained regarding compounded drug preparations themselves. So it's not the master formula, it's the actual preparation. Which, would, which could be in the medical records, the patient records. No. Huh? Well. If it's not in the formula. This was an issue that um, Ms. Halbo and I were a little concerned about because right now E does not exempt IV fluids from the requirements under subsection F. We, we mentioned that you have to document it in the patient's medical record, but there's no exemption here for having to comply with subsection F. So if you don't think that IV fluid preparations need to also be documented separately outside of the patient medical record on a compounded drug preparation document and include items one through eight under subsection F, I think likely they should. I think perhaps the document you're creating under F is what you enter into the patient's medical record for IV fluids to um, qualify for that exemption under subsection E. The, um, I would contend that that information is already in the medical records. And what we're doing by E is trying to prevent the duplication of that. Sure, but things like uh, subsection F, paragraph three, unique compounded drug preparation number, that's not a requirement under subsection E for IV fluids. Um, I'm sorry, what was that? Number three, unique compounded drug right. preparation number, that's not a requirement under E. Expiration date. That's not listed under E, because right now all we have under E is that as long as you indicate the name, strength, and quantity of the components or ingredients added to the sterile solution, and that is documented in the medical record, you don't have to have the separate uh, master formula form. Is that sufficient information for IV fluids? because otherwise everything in one through eight is not documented. I would say, personally, I would say yes, because 
IV fluids are prepared, especially if they're uh, compounded, are prepared for this one patient. They're not going to be used on another patient because they're, it, it's unique in what you're adding and that second patient has other needs than what you've done for this patient. So the expiration date is going to be on the, on the fluid bottle. Um, I, I, again, I'm trying not to duplicate some of this work. Yeah, we recognize medical that. Records. I mean, right now, um, in your medical records, you're going to have this, this information uh, and um, the, in order to put these, these uh, electrolytes and additional medications into that bottle, they already have to have an a, 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 uh, expiration date that goes beyond that day. So we're, we're not worried about that. But to write down an expiration date for every ingredient you put in the IV fluids would be cumbersome. What about uh, number seven, the name or initials of the veterinarian or other individual who made the compounded drug preparation? That would be in the medical records. That's already required. Under what? Under in the medical records, who's writing them up is the initial list to the doctor or the technician. I would be careful about that because this is specific to compounded drugs. Um, if you If you want... So if it's, well, if it's immediate use, it doesn't matter if it's within four hours, which I would say most, if not all, IV fluids are mixed and applied immediately. So, But, uh, but you would want to know whether or not a VACSP holder, I think, you know, to Ms. Ehrlich's point, uh, we, we want to make sure that we're tracking who prepared these drugs for the animal patients. So we likely, you know, the board inspectors would want to know which individual was responsible for preparing a compounded drug in the event that something negative happened with the animal patient. So we can, we can craft this exemption under subdivision or subsection E properly to, you know, include that. But, you know, my, my point here is just making sure that if you want to exempt IV fluids and sterile drug preparations for immediate use under subsection E from the master form, form, formula form under subsection B, you could also say and subsection F, um, but then as you have listed here, if the name, strength, and quantity of the components are documented along with the name or initials of the veterinarian or individual okay. preparing the preparation. That would satisfy. Yeah. 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 I think that that gets you all the really critical information uh, and, and then it's just documented in one place. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other comments from staff or board uh, the committee? So when you're talking about the fluid preparations in E, you're talking about electrolyte imbalances. Are we also talking about things like dextrose then or anything added to yes. a CRI of fluids for one specific patient? Yes. Okay. It could be, could be antibiotics, could be pain medication, it could be electrolytes, whatever is added. Now you've made that fluid, those fluids a compounded preparation. So whatever is added needs to be in the medical records. At least the flow chart that is often used has those components added at what, what you know, at different levels as they're given through the day. Okay. Um, so then in, in item E. I'm, I'm sorry, um, is it okay? Yeah, I'm just, sorry. Dr. Sequoia yes. and I Dr. had a question. Sorry. It, Dr. Sequoia, I think, was first. Well, go ahead, Dr. Bradbury. I'll come in after you. You may address what I, my concern. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Dr. Sullivan. Um, I know it's hard with these um, combo meetings. It's a lot, and you're doing great. Uh, <laughs> 
again, sorry for not being there. Um, my, so I, in that, the IV drug thing that thank you for all the hard work you've done. Obviously you guys have put in a ton of work here and, and really, um, dug down on the, some of the issues that we were concerned about at the last meeting. Um, I wanted to just say, I think we want to make sure that it, it somewhere in there, it is clear that it is only exempt if it's used for individual patients. I have seen practices where they have a bag of IV fluids with like B vitamins and random things in it that they just kind of have in the hospital and they give as sub Q fluids to patients. It's not something that we did in our practice, but I, I have heard of that and I, I feel like seen that. Um, and so I think that somehow making sure individual be, that that the, the exemption is for individual patients was uh, one of my um, thoughts or concerns um, here listening to, to the presentation. Um, secondly, uh, I think we addressed this in the last meeting, but um, it's the, for the immediate use and that they're used in four hours. Uh, yes, IV fluids are started within four hours, but sometimes are used for longer when patients, particularly small patients are in the hospital for days in, you know, 24 hour facilities. Um, I, I don't think that, I think it, it means that once it's compounded, it's being used immediately. So I think that's fine, but I just wanna make sure I, I understood that correctly. Um, and then I do think that we need an expiration date on these somehow um, put somewhere because Sometimes fluids are uh, needed on a patient for longer than um, the, the time that they're good for. And so uh, we, you know, most hospitals have that as a quality control thing, but I, I do feel like it need, probably needs to be stated somewhere that, and you know, they should have an expiration date. Like once you open a bottle of fluids and you're, you, in, you know, put, um, electrolytes and dextrose, et cetera, into a bag that there, there should be an expiration date. Um, most people put it on the sticker that goes on the, the bag and, and usually there's a second kind of sticker that goes into the chart. But if we didn't have that on there, um, and people were using fluids for a week or something, which is not appropriate, um, but they may not, you know, be, be realizing that. So, uh, I think that, that that was it because you guys did address the initials of the doctor on there. So that those were those were my thoughts. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Sequoia. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bradbury. Covered several of my concerns. I realize you worked very hard at this, and you're trying to put a whole bunch of information into section uh, D. However, um, reading it as a general practitioner, my immediate question, well, my immediate read on it was that treating the animal patient's fluid and electrolyte imbalance was separate from ancestral drug preparation, which to me brought up the flag, what about continuous rate infusion? And I would hope that for general practitioners, you would add something like, at the end saying this does apply to continuous rate infusions which are compounded um, and obviously in the medical record there will be the information of the rate so that it will be possible to know how much the animal was given so it just for additional clarification for those people who are not really very well versed in the actual nitty-gritty of the uh, regulations or uh, the legalese. I would ask you to make it a little more clear. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe uh, let me let me try to address um, those comments. When when and we may have to change our immediate use definition a bit. Uh, according to the Board of Pharmacy law on immediate use, it is it begins within four hours of 
of compounding. It can go on for 24 hours. It isn't within four hours. It's beginning administering within four hours. That's the exemption. So to address um, these questions, and we may need to make that a little bit more specific on our definition of immediate use. It says a sterile drug, a compounded drug preparation on an animal patient within four hours from the time the drug preparation was compounded. Um, I mean, it says it. Do we need to make it more clear than that? It means administration of a sterile preparation within four hours from the time the drug was compounded. Okay, so I don't know if we have to clarify that it can go on for 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever, but it, it, if it started, then that's, that's fine. So now to your question on, um, so I, the, possibly the way we clarify this is that if you stop giving fluids at six hours and you keep the bag and, and, re, and, and readminister or administer more from the same bag the next day, then that's not immediate use. And therefore, I don't, you know, may not be able to qualify for the exemption in E. We could handle it that way. We could say, I mean, I, I you know, um, Dr. Brad, uh, Bradbury, you are in practice, so we're trying to make this um, as doable as we can for a really busy, busy practice. So um, I don't know if we want to add that item E as an exemption if it is used in immediate use. Tara? It seemed to me that Dr. Bradbury was talking more about labeling the bag for expiration so that people would know um, when to stop using it, that it was no longer, I mean. If it's, if it's being used continuously and then thrown out, that's not a problem. The problem is if they stop using it and go ahead and use it the next day or a week later or whatever, then, we, then it, I would say it shouldn't qualify for this exemption. Right, and the bag itself would have the expiration date because that's what's required under what 2093, the, the labeling requirement. So the, the product itself would have to be thrown out. But as far as um, documenting the preparation itself, we, we want to make sure that that's in the medical record, but do you need the expiration date in the patient's medical record? We, we can require it. I, I, you know, if it's immediate use and when they're done with the bag, it's thrown out, I, don't, I think okay. it's redundant to then turn around and have to require to put it in the medical records what the expiration date was. Right. That's why I'm saying, you know, the, the package itself should contain the expiration date. And then um, if the fluid itself is, is the administration of the fluid stops at some point and that goes beyond the four hours, it seems to me perhaps the, the, the language necessary here is that no preparation um, prepared as immediate use that is not so used within that four hours should be thrown out. No, no, the, the definition is the preparation begins the uh, administration within four hours. How long that continuous administration goes, it could be 12 hours, it could be 24 hours. So that's not a limiting factor. The limiting factor is if the preparation is made and it's used after four hours, that has to be documented. What if, what if you put uh, each administration, for immediate use means each administration of a sterile compound and drug, because that, your example was to use it for that four hours and then put it away and then come back the next day and do it. But if it's only administered once, they can continue to use that, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you do each administration, does that help? So, so can I, do you guys mind if I just clarify because the, sure. my, my concern was not, I, I feel like if it was used within four hours and that same, like if, for example, if you 
made a bag of subcutaneous fluids and um, for a patient and administered it. Uh, that was in the record. The patient came back the next day and it's the same patient. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, so long as it's appropriate use with the expiration, that's fine. My concern is, is the ones that have people actually have uh, fluid bags for the hospital that they, and I know this sounds crazy, but I've, se- I've just seen it. Um, and so I don't know that, that, that where, where, you know, different patients are being administered fluids from the same preparation. It may be, you know, removed with a 60 CC syringe or I, I, in different ways, but, um, it's like a hospital bag. And if we have IV fluids as an exemption, I just want to make sure it's for an individual patient um, because otherwise they should have a master compounding formula. So it's, that was one of the things. And then the expiration date, I just wanted to make sure there was some requirement and that may be just in general that there's already a requirement in regulations that an expiration date be placed on a, a, you know, any time that we open something or, or uh, reformulate things. So, do you think that the expiration date needs to be documented in the medical records? Um, I just think it needs to be. There needs to be some requirement that an expiration date is on the bottle, or you know. Okay. And I think that's already, if that's already in regulations, um, then it, it would be redundant to put it in the record. I do not think that it's already in the medical re- or in uh, the practice act in any form because we are, uh, this is our first go at regulating compounded preparations. I don't even yeah, think I, it's I, there for bottle of fluids. I mean, I think that when, you know, I think it's common standards in a, hospital typically where, you know, if you reconstitute um, a, uh, a an intravenous um, medication, like an antibiotic or something that you write the date that you do it because it expires within a certain, right. it's not really the expir- expiratory date that you usually write on there. It's the date that you opened it, um, although that may be backwards. Uh, and the same with the fluids, you usually put the date that it's, it, it, they're opened and things are added to it. But, um, so I I just don't, I think that, um, it's standard practice that people do that, but it, if we're, you know, wanting to make sure this is all done correctly, then maybe we should be looking at, you know, putting an expiratory date on, on these things. Uh, okay. I'd, I'd be interested in like what Dr. Payton thinks because she kind of works in those settings as well, um, or anybody in the public, or or really what others think about that. <laughs> Thanks for calling me out. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think Dr. Bradbury brings up some really good points as far as. Um, definitely, when we looked at Dr. The, Payton, can you yeah. speak closer to the mic, please? Oh, sure. Hey, my little voice. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think having the expiration date, especially, you know, we we always write the date that something's opened. Like when you add something to it, who added it. Um, I think expiration can be a little tricky because I think we need information. You have to look up what the drug that you're using, that particular expiration date. Um, But I do think it's a good thing to have on there because I do think it gives guidance for when we should get rid of that. Okay. Um, So in in your in your practice, you're putting down the date that it was opened and used. Are you putting down an expiration date? So I think it, again, it goes back to, are we looking at intravenous fluids or this, like a sterile drug preparation? And I know we're talking about them in the same thing, but they're slightly different. Um, so if you're, like Dr. Bradbury brought up, opening up an antibiotic and reconstituting it, 
we're always putting date, time, and who reconstituted it for that particular individual animal, or then the non-exception would be if it's not if it's for the practice itself, the office stock. Um, now, if you look at you know in the past we've had quality control within a in an individual practice where you know within 24 hours you need to get rid of that drug. But I'll say a lot of places we don't write the expiration date. It's been time opened, time uh, date opened, and then you know in your SOPs or your standard operating procedures that you get rid of it within 24 hours, or if you freeze it, you can keep it longer. Um, but I do think it's something to, you know, because I agree with Dr. Bradbury in that there are several practices where it is, you know, it, it's harder with office stock versus an individual patient. Um, I think it'd be ideal for an expiration date on everything, but it can be tricky because if you add several different drugs to a bag of fluids, when specifically is that expiration date? And, well, and I think that's where it gets a little tricky. Well, it is. Um, especially, I, I mean, right here we're focusing on intravenous preparations. Um, I think uh, the, uh, you know, reconstituting an antibiotic is pretty straightforward in that there's manufacturer recommendations that, yeah. and that is not compounding, okay? But when you add it when, yeah. to the fluids, it is. Mm -hmm. And um, our regs say that if you're adding an ingredient, um, you either have X number of days to use it, depending on if it's sterile or non-sterile, or the date that any of the ingredients expires before that. So the question is, how do we document that on fluids and, and still be efficient in our use? Um, so one suggestion is that, uh, that we add, I believe it's the word an before animal, is that it? All intravenous fluid preparations administered to an animal patient. Is that where you wanted it? You could, but the the definition for immediate use is is already on an animal patient. Yes. And so, to me, it's already covered in that definition because you're including. It's only pertaining to immediate use. But we don't have that in in E yet. So you have immediate use in E. Da, 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 da. Does immediate use only apply to sterile drug preparations? Oh. Okay. Well, that implies that it is just to one patient, and uh, that's where we will draw the line. Now, if it's used on consecutive days. That's when you could add in means each administration. Because so each oh, time, I see where it is. <laughs> so if you it, so an E would read immediate use means each administration, and then it already says on an animal patient. So that could be the same patient in multiple administrations. It wouldn't. It would now fall out of immediate use because it, there's multiple. So oh, I'm sorry. Where were you adding? Under uh, definition of. I would not add each administration because E. Um, 2090E is the definition of immediate use. And immediate use isn't necessarily the administration or the, the preparation, it's the action. Immediate use is you have to use it right now. It's not the preparation itself. So if we add means each administration, that changes the action administer to the preparation itself, the, the, the drug. So I don't, I don't think we should add each administration there. I think immediate use right there likely is fine because what we're talking about is the exemption for medical record keeping or compounded drug keeping under E. So I think under E, perhaps you should have each, instead of all intravenous fluid preparations, you, 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 could change it to each intravenous fluid preparation administered to an animal patient for treatment of the animal patient's fluid and electrolyte imbalance 
and sterile drug preparation. I think we could do or or a sterile drug preparation for immediate use on the animal patient is exempt from the requirements of subsection B and subsection F if the name, strength, and quantity of the components or ingredients added to a sterile solution and the name initials, uh, you know, that's the information from subsection F paragraph seven are documented in the patient's medical record. I, I think that since this is starting to get a little confusing and I think we should all be able to read it see it because this stuff is really important. I think changes to subsection E should be brought back to the MDC at the next meeting so we can all really make sure that we've got all of the information that should be documented in each patient's medical record specifically right. listed. I think under E, subsection E likely should be, uh, you know, paragraph one, two, three. Okay. Uh, that way we, it's very clear if, um, if you're exempt from the master formula form, and you're exempt from the compounded drug preparation document, these are the specific items you must document in the animal patient medical record. All right. Okay. I can uh, see a number more phone calls uh, in between now yeah. and the end of the I would only meeting. ask though, in order for, for us to move forward with, with that um, and to take it back, I think the only thing that I haven't been quite clear on is where we landed, do we want expiration date included or not? I think that's what we need from the MDC um, and then we can include that or not. Well, comments from the board, uh, the committee? Yes, please. Dr. Babry. Dr. Babry. Hi again. Um, yes, so, you know, even in some of the compounded medications that we make for oral use or um, eye drop administration, et cetera, there sometimes isn't um, evidence-based uh, information that, you know, provides us with when something is um, expiring. So we have to use our best judgment to create an ex expiratory date um, for some of those things. And I feel like um, with, while it's complicated with IV fluids, I think that veterinarians are capable of, of you know, of, of looking at data and determining uh, what the safest sort of expiration date would be. Um, so I, I do think that, and again, most, most practices, like for example, you know, we, would usually change out our bags within 72 hours um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and, yet, and yet we don't um, necessarily, you know, it isn't based on, you know, when the potassium would expire. So I think that it would be reasonable to ask doctors to do that. Um, and then I, I wanted to go back because I, I don't think we said anything more about um, what Dr. Sequoia is concerned about um, constant rate infusions, uh, which are also very, very much similar to the IV fluids and sometimes are placed in IV fluids, but other times are, you know, in a syringe mixed together. Um, and so when we're, and I think that they kind of are very, you know, they're, they're very similar in that they are very closely documented in the record. Uh, and are very individualized to each patient. And, um, and I, I think that the exemption, having it be specific to electrolyte, um, I, I can't remember the exact terminology, but it would, would make the constant rate infusions of, for example, um, you know, a, a fentanyl, lidocaine, ketamine, uh, CRI that would not fall under that. Um, so I, I just I wondered if the wording um, is too specific for the electrolyte imbalances. So we do have in section E after fluid and electrolyte imbalances 
we have and sterile drug preparations for immediate use are exempt. Wouldn't those, uh, wouldn't that category? It would, well, thanks, uh, sorry. I, yeah, that makes sense. That's perfect. Okay, we, I, I wanna make sure. Um, and then uh, a question for you, um, again, trying not to duplicate things, is putting the expiration date on the bag adequate for you? As opposed to putting it on the bag and in the medical records? I think the the problem with it being just on the bag, and I think it should be adequate in general. But the problem is, and again, usually people just kind of do duplicate stickers and put one in the the record to make it easy. But the problem with it just being on the bag is that that gets thrown away. So if there were complaints, it would be very difficult to um, determine whether this was being done or not, but uh, that would be the only concern with it just being on the bag. Well, that would be true with any immediate use medications then. Well, but we're, we're having them document everything else in the medical record about the immediate use medications. No, we're right? exempting immediate use. Well, e is an exemption because they're the the drugs themselves are like the IV fluids with what is added to them is in the re medical record. That's why we're exempting that, right? I mean, one yeah. of the reasons is that it's documented elsewhere, so they don't need a mask and, and to try and make it so that people can actually comply and also have time to treat their their patients, but. You know, that's it's in the medical record for you know all of the components. So I I don't know I I, I don't want to dictate what everyone else is doing. It's just okay. So what we're going to do then is is rework item E and bring it back to the next meeting. Um and and um yeah. So yes, Dr. Payton. Yeah, I mean, I just to comment, I agree. I think it needs a, a lot more language and clarification for that exemption. Um, Cause I think it's great. I'm really happy about this exemption. Cause I do think it's something that we use all the time. To answer your question about expiration date, I think that it's pretty standard for most of us, again, to put that sticker on the bag, date it's made, time it's made, who made it, and then have a that tentative expiration date that gives that guidance. I think if we're making this an exemption to having that master formula, I think that that information should be in the record. And like Dr. Bradbury said, oftentimes having the two stickers, putting one on the bag, one somewhere in the record is very helpful to kind of trace that back of who made it, was it thrown away, that information. The only other things I'll add that could be considered for the language is I agree, I wouldn't say each administration because if you start IV fluids and you have to take them off to walk them or do something else, I don't want that to get confusing. Um, but I like the idea of including individual animal patients. Okay. I think we have that. Okay, so we'll bring that back next uh, time. Uh, any more comments from the board? We're gonna get comments from the public at the end of this. I only had one more question about the immediate use definition in E. Um, Can you I, talk closer to the mic? Yeah, sorry. So the definition of immediate use um, in part E above, it does say the preparation on an animal patient within four hours, but I'm not sure if it was written down or just our understanding that that's beginning within four hours. I don't know if that should be made more clear or if that matters or not. Um, as far as, you know, they're gonna be on the fluids for 24 hours. Um, yeah, we have within four hours, but we'll, we, we may need to clarify that, so. Just right. as I read over before. it. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, so we'll be back with that. Now, item F is a flow chart that takes the formula from the formula uh, uh, form to actually making the preparation. And so on that, and we, we've got a template, we don't have it in the packet yet, but we've got this up. So we, we've got to get some of this through before we actually, you know, present the form. So what we're doing is we're identifying, um, we're identifying the formula by its code and then we are adding a, um, we're adding the, the date of the preparation. You can kind of look at this as a flow chart. Um, the date of the preparation, and then a unique compounding number, preparation number, so that we can link the, the unique code and the unique compounding number as it flows through the chart. The name of each active and in, inactive ingredient of the preparation, the expiration date of each active and inactive ingredient, um, the client number, the animal, patient, or herd number, or if this is being prepared as office stock. And then seven is the um, name and initials of the veterinarian and um, or the RVT or permit holder as to who is compounding the product. And then the expiration date of the compounding preparation, because that's determined by uh, the, uh, the, the um, regs or by the expiration date of any of the ingredients. Any questions on that? And that produces that, that flow from making it to wherever it's going. Yes, Dr. Payton. I just had a clarification on the unique formula code that is set by that individual hospital, yes. veterinarian. Okay, so it's unique to that. So, so the formula, master formula form is a list of all of the formulas that that clinic is going to make. Doesn't change. If, if the composition of a formula changes, then it's a new formula. If the active ingredients changes, then it's another formula. But that clinic makes a code for each one of those. So once that's made, that work is done. The real work is in this flow chart, which um, you know, you'll be able to fill out in 30 seconds. And it'll be a lot easier once you see it. <laughs> Anything we're missing on this that we need to have as far as part of the documentation of compounding a preparation. I have a question, Dr. Sequoia here. Yes. Um, I noticed it says the expiration of inactive ingredients. Uh, <laughs> That to me is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, well, it, it seems peculiar if something is inactive, I consider it to be inert and not have an expiration date. Well, like I can't answer that it. question because I don't know. Okay, well, uh, I would ask that perhaps uh, when you go back and look at things, um, that's something that might be considered because it is in the wording, uh, the expiration date of all active and inactive ingredients. Right, I'll check that, I'll check that out. Um, Thank you. I, I am quite sure that I picked that up from the Board of Pharmacy, but I'll double check that. I'm sure you did, but just, yeah. you know, legally we're, we're being required to consider that it's received wisdom for them, from them, and it's all 100% correct, but I'm saying, I'm getting the feeling there are some oversights on their part, and then if we just accept it as rote and there's a problem down the road, I, I hate to be in the position where we could have said, you know, this seems kind of weird, and perhaps we should do some, look at it now before we implement it. Definitely. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
And then uh, the last item on page 10, um, before we go to the next section, is uh, training and supervision of the RVT or permit holder uh, who is compounding the drug preparation. That we just changed the, the wording there and added uh, permit holder. So, a lot of material. Um, any more comments from the committee members on section 20, 2092? Any comments from the public that are in the room? Never thought of that. Grant Miller, CVMA. I have no idea what this is saying. I'm completely confused by this. And if the only people that understand this are those who wrote it, it's not going to work. So I, my biggest problem is trying to figure out what exactly we need to document. So the, the master formula code form in 2092B makes sense. But then what doesn't make sense is F because it almost looks like you're duplicating what's in B for F. So I'm not sure we're going to solve it today, but I can tell you that from somebody who makes their living advising people on regulatory compliance, I don't even, I, I don't understand this. So I think it needs a lot more work and I don't really have a lot of answers for it. Um, but um, I'd be willing to try to work with you uh, if if you have future phone calls on it or or, or anything I can do to, to try to help in any way, I will. But right now, it's just not coming clear for me. Okay. Um, so the, the, the master formula is pretty straightforward. We went over that last time. So what we're trying to do is to document what happens when the actual preparation is made. When is it made? When's the expiration date? Who made it? And where is it going? And that's what the spreadsheet does. That's what item, uh, item F is. And I have a spreadsheet that shows that. And I'll go over that. I mean, what I'm saying is when we put the education package together, it will make more sense. I think the flow chart of when that preparation is made um, will be like the formula page. It'll, it'll make some sense. But I don't know how else we're going to follow when that formula was made and where it goes unless we document the, pa the pathway. Um, okay, well, we'll hope that that guidance document is really clear. <laughs> I still am not understanding it, I'm sorry. I just, um, I've gotten lost along the way here with this. I've read it several times every time I read it. It, it just, again, it, the part B, I, got that. That's like a formulary. It's like a um, monograph. It's like a monograph, yes. essentially. So it's a, it's, a, it's a master recipe book for all the things that are made in that practice. Right. Right. So then with F, each time you make one, this wouldn't be on the label. It would just be a document that exists in addition to your master formula document. Right. Okay. So, I mean, once... But it contains a lot of the same information that's in the master formula document. It doesn't contain any information that's in the master formula except the unique formula code. It'll contain the ingredients, but it'll contain the ingredients and their expiration date. That expiration date, you can't put in the formula because it changes every time you get a new bottle. Right, but no, there's duplicative information here. So the, there's the, the active ingredient. So, the, so for instance, F requires the name of each active and inactive ingredient. Item B requires the name and quantity of each of the active ingredients and the name, strength, and quantity in each of the inactive ingredients. Right. It's duplicative. So I, 
it, it's it's going to be confusing. The other thing is I want to rem- I want everyone to also remember the tremendous amount of workload that veterinarians have, and if there's duplicative paperwork that we can avoid, it would be beneficial to all parties. So I I think I'm understanding kind of where you're going. I would I would imagine though that like the information that you're looking for would just be on the label, and we're already required to to do labeling of medications like you can't have anything in the hospital that doesn't have a label on it the label usually has you know the name and the expiration and those things on it so this additional document in f to me it just seems like maybe either it needs to be pared way down or we don't need it at all but i i will defer to you if you have some kind of example of this like a visual that we can see it would be good well if if you can put together a label that satisfies the code we're going off of what the regulation says. Right. So um, there are still drug labeling requirements, though, right, that are in addition to this. I mean, there's no way you can ever have a, anything in a hospital, like a vial or a bag or anything that doesn't have a label on it. Yes. Yeah, the so, office doc will have a label, right. which will have, we've pared that down to having the formula code, the preparation number, expiration date, and the initials of who did it, who compounded it. Okay. So I just question, I guess, what it's coming down is I question this section F, like what is the need for it? I think that's where I'm, I'm landing on it. It doesn't, okay. it, I, B, I got, it makes sense. Labeling 2094 there, but this section F, it just seems like it's duplicative to me and it might confuse people, so thanks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go over it with you, and if okay. you can streamline it more, I will be in forever indebted to you. I, I would just like to see an example of what you're talking about. Like, it sounds like you you have some of this already in action yeah. working. I'd like to see what that looks like. Um, and then also I want to be careful, too, about this. Once the law is written, the law, it, it's always here, but these education documents, they can come and go. You know, if it's totally contingent upon you needing an education document to understand it, I'm worried about it because I really feel like the law needs to be more clear. Um, I this is complicated stuff. I mean, that's the, the 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 argument of compounding has has you know destroyed the board of pharmacy for years. It's been a major issue over there, and you know here we are. We're trying to tackle some of it too to get our arms around it. And I think we're experiencing some of the same you know challenges that they have with it, um, but I, I feel like, again, if no one understands it, we, we can't move a lot with it. So um, anyway, we'll keep working on it, and I appreciate that, that you're, you're willing to help us go through it a little bit and see if we can't make it a little bit more clear. Okay. Thank you. Moderator, can you uh, open the WebEx for public comment, please? Uh, yes, this is the moderator. Um, the Q&A feature has been open uh, for members of the public if they wish to make a comment. Um, I do have one request um, from Ken Pulowski. And um, Mr. Pulowski, I will request to unmute your microphone. You'll be given three minutes to speak in a 15-second warning. Uh, please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears. All right, and you are unmuted. And Mr. Pelowski, if you wanted to give a comment, uh, now is your time. You are unmuted and I'm doesn't seem I can hear you. Okay, um, it appears he, uh, the only comment he had was the one he wrote in the Q&A, which was cherry syrup has an expiration date. Um, and with that, uh, <laughs> it appears there are no further comments. Um, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Uh, could you read the comment again, please? Yeah, um, it looks like he posted the 
couple now. Um, the comment was cherry syrup has an expiration date and inactive ingredients like sterile water have expiration dates. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, any other comments? Uh, this is the moderator. Appears there are no further comments. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Okay, um, seeing that we've got more work to do, uh, we will not need a motion on this action item. Um, we'll keep working at it until it is as efficient as we can make it and still allow veterinarians to compound in their practices. Um, with that, then we'll move on to item seven, update on the complaint process audit committee from, I should say. And who is that? Dr. Bradbury and Dr. Sequoia. Okay, Dr. Bradbury and Dr. Sequoia, you're up. Right, um, Dr. Bradbury just got back, so she's a little jet lagged, so she asked me to uh, do the initial run through. If you'll just give me a moment with all these icons to get to it, um, I would be happy to do that. Hang on a second. Yeah. Uh, um, let's go ahead. Wait a second, uh, Dr. Sequoia. Let's take a, a 15 minute break and then we'll get back to you. Wonderful. I, I would appreciate a bio break. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, Dr. Sequoia, you're on. Muted. Dr. Sequoia, you're muted if you're speaking. What are you tell? Okay, I'm on mute. Great. Um, so I assume um, the uh, people have the. Uh, the uh, memo in front of them, is that correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, um, per the direction we were given, we went ahead and um, uh, after the um, expert content um, meeting, we went ahead uh, with that and we went ahead using utilizing the California Medical Board um, format, uh, we provided uh, actual updates, well, I should, excuse me, not updates, we provided um, feedback to our, several of our experts on current cases. And uh, Dr. Bradbury and I have been developing um, using the uh, California Medical Board um, format um, a series of veterinary medical specific um, cases where it's the scenario is laid out for our experts in training and they make the decision was there a violation or not. Um, we have also been uh, taking into account that the comments that came in about um, some of the experts actually got too specific and would try to say uh, what the um, what the penalty should be uh, or what the finding should be, in, and going beyond just saying yes, there was a violation, and here here it is, you know, records or whatever. Uh, it was, as a personal note, I found it very interesting to find out about what the VMB um, and executive officer use, um, how they use these inspections uh, and complaints uh, as teaching exercises for the licensees and what warning letters do, how long they stay in the file, and what happens if somebody repeats that. So. Um, 
we hope to bring you at the in the October meeting, uh, bring you actual some of our um, case examples that we have set up for the experts. Uh, any questions? And I would ask invite Dr. Bradbury to um, elucidate any anything further. Great. Th thanks, Diane, and, and thanks for um, meeting uh, as much as we did. We had we had a, several really, I think, productive meetings. Um, so uh, I think one comment I would make under the complaint review, I think this was the first time that Dr. Sequoia um, was reviewing cases, so she wouldn't have the opportunity to, to, to see this, but um, but I have uh, I I saw quite a difference, um, which a positive difference, in um, in the expert witness um, reviews of the cases, uh, an improvement in that they were. It seemed like less biased, um, my, almost no emotional language. It was more objective um, responses and. There were several where, you know, there was no offense found. Um, and I just, uh, I just can see that some of the processes and the, the recommendations and the training and things um, seems to really have been, uh, seem to really be helping um, improve uh, their reports. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then I also, uh, Going down our, our examples, I, I wanted to just uh, make another comment there. We wanted to provide like I, one of the examples, you know, we, we wanted to provide examples that, you know, on paper, the complaint um, may look, you know, bad, but when you look through it, um, it may not actually be a violation. So we, we included both uh, no deviation from the standard of care, you know, all the way up to extreme deviation. So we have several examples there um, and uh, we're really hopeful that that, that helps our experts, um, you know, be able to utilize those to, to, to go over their cases. We are, I think, planning on, on you know, continuing with the training um, in the future too, which we did before the last meeting um, and that that I think went really well. As for the reference, uh, the references, um, I the the draft, I know Dr. Miller had asked um, for a copy of those. I, I haven't, we haven't really finalized that. We weren't, we were trying to get those, um, the uh, examples done, um, but um, we, the, the reference list is uh, mostly uh, kind of related to what students are, are being asked to, to look at. Um, and it's not that, to be clear, those references aren't like, you know, an end all be all. It's just so that they, so that experts have some idea of, of um, what books are out there and, and can be used. Uh, I did have the thought that I, I don't know if the CVMA um, has any uh, um, examples that they give their members for, you know, the hospital libraries, because I know that, you know, all hospitals are required to have a, a library. And so uh, if they did have any examples that they, you know, gave their um, members, we Love to see those. That would be, um, I think, useful. Um, and then the last comment is just that we we uh, one of our priorities uh, between now and the next meeting is uh, to review that subject matter expert criteria uh, and have that for your the next MDC meeting. So that's it for me. Uh Dr. Bradbury, that was great. I thought of one other thing I did want to mention. Uh, you pointed out you've been on the subcommittee for a while and you've seen a uh, change for the uh, in, for improvement uh, on the reports our subject matter experts are writing. Uh, and I would agree, 
I, I brought up at the last uh, last subcommittee meeting that uh, most veterinarians are overachievers. So there seemed to be the possibility that when presented with a case, um, the subject matter expert felt compelled to find something wrong to show that they were actually earning their keep. So uh, we agreed that we would put something in the training material saying, you don't have to find something wrong. It's okay. We know you did a good job. Would you say that's true, Dr. Bradbury? Yes. Yeah. We 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 just we want to make sure that that people remain really objective and and fair and and know that uh, we we really want them to just come at it as an as a unbiased individual and and they you know many times there is uh, no deviation from the standard of care. So yeah, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, great work. Um, and we're looking at uh, we're looking at your continued work in this area. Uh, any comments from the committee members? Can I just make one clarifying statement? Because just to to go to Dr. Sequoia's comment about uh, telling the experts that they don't have to find a violation, um, I just want to clarify that the majority of the cases that our subject matter experts find. Uh, that they review don't find a deviation or it's very minor towards the educational letter. But I understand it might seem like they're looking for things because the only cases that Dr. Bradbury and Dr. Sequoia are reviewing are the cases where they found some deviation. So if you just look at our statistics, like I said, the majority of them that they are reviewing, they find no deviation. I just didn't want, I just didn't want that out there that they are looking for violations. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. I didn't want to imply that either. Um, Jessica, is, is it 90% or something like that, that, that? So in our enforcement training, we just looked at some statistics and it was 97% of our cases that we get do not proceed to any kind of enforcement action, that's citations or disciplinary action. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Uh, any comments from the uh, public? Grant Miller, CVMA. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bradbury and Dr. Sequoia for that report. I just want to clarify, I, I'm not in any need of reviewing your reference library, my request, which is reflected accurately in the minutes, was that when this is finally assembled, it just be something that's available for licensees to see so that they know, you know, how they can comply, um, you know, based on what the board is looking at as valid reference materials. Um, and then to answer Dr. Bradbury's question regarding does the CVMA have reference materials, we, we don't have a list of specific materials, but what we do remind people is that their um, reference materials must be current. So if they have a book from, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that's probably not going to be adequate. We also do mention to them that um, they can have both uh, printed physical copies and they can also have electronic references um, as long as they have the ability to prove that they're um, people have access to that online, that, that that works fine, and that's how we help to um, advise people. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, moderator, could you open the uh, uh, WebEx for any comments from the public online? The public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q and A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen, or use the raise hand function. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q and A panel and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q and A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, it looks like our last item is the uh, agenda eight, future agenda items and meeting dates. All right, so our next uh, MDC meeting is here on October 18th, 2022. 
all the meetings so far um, will be uh, scheduled, tentatively scheduled here with the, always the options for a hybrid meeting. I did provide tentative 2023 meeting dates um, for a few reasons. I know some members have asked for that and usually we don't do the next year until October, but because we've received those requests and they're usually always around the same time, the third week of every month in January, April, July, and October. I provided those dates. Also, it helps us uh, get the meeting rooms because those meeting rooms fill up really, really fast. Uh, so I provided those tentative dates. Uh, as long as we don't receive any uh, comments or concerns from the board, I think that's going to be final. But if anybody does have conflicts, please let us know. And then I provided a list of the current MDC assignments there. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions with that. I do have a minor update with the uh, the animal, community animal blood banking guidance. Uh, I do know that CDFA, they just hired a, an individual to run up their program and they are the ones who's supposed to kind of um, lead the, the stakeholder meetings with the board to, and other stakeholders to create the guidance document. And so they, they just hired that individual. I have a first meeting with them next week. And then after that, we'll need uh, to find what subcommittee members want to participate in those those meetings, because I think they hope to start those up uh, in August uh, to have the first round of stakeholder meetings. So uh, I do anticipate some kind of update on that at the October meeting as indicated here. Also the uh, cannabis recommendation guidelines that that's tied to AB uh, 1883 and that's in appropriations right now. They're on recess, but it'll be heard, I believe on, on August 1st for appropriations, but it, it does look like it's going to go go through. So I think that's that's likely that uh, the the NBC will be working on those guidance guidelines soon. That's for cannabis. Oh, yeah, for okay. cannabis. So that's all I have. Um, do you have to ask for the public? Yeah. Let's ask. For Any comments from the from the committee? Uh, any comments from uh, the public in the room? Hearing none, uh, moderator, could you ask if there's any comments on the this item from the public? Uh, this is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And it looks like seeing none, uh, would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Okay, I think we're finished. Yep. We don't have to vote on that, do we? No. Nope. Okay, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.